Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. This is Rajiv S. Khanna from Immigration.com. The law offices of Rajiv S. Khanna PC. We had to cut out our community conference calls for a couple of weeks because of the H-1B filing madness. We are back in action. Some questions had been posted that I couldn't take earlier. So we'll deal with all of that today. To remind you, this is our bi-weekly community conference call and I expect to continue doing it until the next level of madness strikes us again. I'm expecting some um, big problems with H-1B approvals this year. So we are getting ready to start a litigation process for that. So we'll see how this all goes, but until I get busy again, I'll be happy to be here with you folks. Let me get started with the questions. I didn't have time to go over uh, the questions today other than the first one. So as I read them, please bear with me. Um, we'll get started. The first question is from Contact GS. Perm has been filed but not approved yet. The perm one year will be up on April 15th. Six years will be up on April 30th. Well, it doesn't look like you have a problem because you can file for an H-1B extension now. I don't know why you are waiting. You should be file it. You, you can file it right now. File your H-1 extension right away. Prevailing wage processing time right now, I just checked with my office. I'm being told it's about three months time. Okay. Star 5, if anybody has a follow-up question on this, star 5, press star 5 on your phone. No new questions. Any follow-up on this issue? Okay, San Jose. Yeah, California, go ahead, please. Uh, hi, Rajiv Ji. Uh, how are you? Good, sir. How are you? Uh, I'm doing good, thank you. I, I I think I joined a bit late. Uh, so are you are you talking about the first question, right? I yeah, just I just that. finished the first Sorry question, and I said you can file your H-1B extension right now. There is no problem. Okay. 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 And I also okay. said that the so even if it goes, the prevailing wages are taking about three months, according to my office. Okay, so it doesn't matter. It uh, the H-1B should be approved before the six years. It can no, be no, extended. no. That all that is all that is very old. Uh, that's prior to 2005. They used to think like that. Last 13 years, they haven't thought okay. like that. Now, even if there is a gap in H-1B, it's no problem. So, but you are entitled okay. to file an H-1B extension right away. Please do so. Okay, okay, okay. And if, if my perm gets rejected, uh, 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 would that be a problem? Uh, no, because while an appeal against the perm is pending, you can still get extensions. Okay, okay. Okay. Got it. All right. Okay. Good luck. Okay. Sir. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Uh, you have to forgive me. I didn't get, like I said, I didn't get a chance to read the questions today. Um, so I'm going to read them as we go along. I returned back to my home country after using all six years up until May 2013. So H-1B six years are over. I-140 got approved in August 2017. So first of all, because your H-1 was approved within the last six years, as far as I can tell, there is a, there is a lot of interplay between policy and regulations here. Some things are written down in regulations, some things are just policy. And Trump has been changing policy or Trump administration has been changing policy uh, to the strictest extent possible. So I don't know what tomorrow brings. But as of yesterday, the law was this. If your H-1B had been approved in the last six years, yours was good till May 2013. So up until May 2019, if your H-1B is approved, it should be approved for three years based upon your approved I-140 and it should not be subject to the quota. Okay, so if you apply now, you should be approved for three years and it should not be subject to the quota. After May 2019, I don't know how the law would be. I would still argue that you're not subject to the quota, but I think it's a little bit more difficult to uh, give a straight answer on that. 
So if I were you, I would file the extension and get it approved before May 2019. And even if you have to take some extra time to come into the USA after that, that should be okay. As long as uh, go get your H-1B visa stamped. And if you're not able to come for a few months more, as long as the job offered in USA is still available for the H-1, you should be fine. Star five, if you have a follow-up question on this, no new questions, star five for a follow-up question, please. Okay, let's go on to the next one. This is about working on an in-house project, company got acquired. Well, first thing you want to know is you want to look at successor in interest doctrine. So the idea of a successor in interest, both in terms of an H-1B and green card is this. If a company comes and takes over another company, either the whole company or the assets of the company or a discrete branch or department of the company which you in which you work, but your job remains the same, nothing gets interrupted. Your H-1 goes on, your green card goes on. There are minor modifications that need to be done but usually that is not a problem. So you appear to be in a successor in interest situation, but only your company lawyers can tell you what kind of takeover or restructuring of the company it was. If it meets the successor in interest requirements, you should be able to get your H-1B visa stamping even though the company names have changed and the companies have changed. Now. If for some reason the H-1B is denied and you are stuck in India, you can't file I-485. For that, you have to be inside the USA, but you can convert your case to, pre, uh, to consular processing. So you can have your lawyers file Form I-824 and convert yours and your family's case to consular processing, which means your case over the next few months will be transferred to India and you can go interview in the consulate. Your I-140 already got approved and more than 180 days. Now I crossed my six years. I'm on extension using I in USA for almost 11 years if my H-1B is denied. Yes, you should be able to file a cap exempt H-1B because you've had an H-1B approved within the last six years and you're entitled to your extensions because of your I-140 approval. So I don't see any problem. Star five, if you have a follow-up question, no new questions. Any follow-up question on this? Okay. I have two questions, it looks like. One is from Pennsylvania, and the other one is from Illinois. So let's go to, I guess, 570, which is Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania, go ahead, please. Uh, hi Raji, good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, I am the person who posted the question. Yes, sir. Um, uh, say like um, uh, if I if I am not going to India and I just just sent my family to India and uh, say like uh, my 485 is becoming current and then um, do my family has to be coming to USA to file my 485 or you know they can be in India and file. You can always split the case up. We have many cases where the wife and the child is in India. Let's say they are finishing up college or something. Then you can convert your case to 485 or remain your case in 485 and convert their case to consular processing. So they will interview in India while you interview in USA. Okay, but uh, that is one 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 case. Uh, but if if they are coming to US uh, and we all file together for 85, mm -hmm. and then after filing together as a family, then can they leave to India or during the filing of 485 they need to be in USA? No, no, they can leave as long as they come back for any interviews etc. that are required, uh, and as long as their advance parole is valid, they can be outside USA. No problem. Okay, okay. So, uh, okay, if we are not splitting the uh, our case to file 485, is it possible like when they are in India uh, and uh, can I file as a family uh, yeah, when I'm I already, here I already, in US? I already told you that. You can do your 485 
and their counselor processing or if you want to do everybody's counselor processing including your own you can do that also uh, can i also do like 485 for everybody here uh, when they are in I, india i already answered that question you cannot unless they are in the united states you can't file their 485 okay okay rajiv thank you very much you're welcome good luck thank you okay uh, illinois go ahead please oh sorry illinois go ahead please uh, hello, Raji. So uh, I'm sorry if you're having to reiterate this, but uh, you said that if the H-1B has a state approved in the last six years, even if, if even if the whole six-year H-1B like validity, like the, the period of work has been uh, completed, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, because, if, the, yeah. if the I-140 yeah. has been... Yeah. There are two different issues here. One is, how long can I work on H-1? The answer is six years. Second, when am right. I exempt from H-1 quota? The answer is if your H-1 has been approved within the last six years. So these are two separate questions. We can't conflate them. We can't put them together. So if your H-1 was approved in the last six years, you're not subject to the quota. You should be able to get an extension without any problem. Oh, so, uh, and that has nothing to do with uh, an I-140 having been a state as staying approved for 180 days uh, in order to get the uh, extension again. Like you're capping you them the automatically, company, even if you... If you are with the same, well, actually, let me rephrase that. Um, as long as the I-140 has been applied and it has not, I mean, sorry, uh, it has been approved. I don't care if it was approved 180 days ago or it was approved yesterday. You can get your three-year H-1 extension. The 180-day rule comes into play only if your employer has revoked the I-140. If they revoked it before 180 days, then you okay. can't get extensions. If they revoked it after 180 days, you can still get extensions, no problem. And this, uh, you can get extensions with a different employer. Yes. If with a break also. In both, both if, cases. Okay. As long as your I-140 is alive, you can get extensions through any employer. If it has been killed, if it uh, then you can get extensions only if it was killed after 180 days. And through any employer. And that is regardless of whether or not there was a break in between two H-1Bs. That's not, that's not an issue. Okay, and even if the, the original six years have been completed, okay, so that's, yes, yeah, that's for an extension. Okay. All right. Good luck, sir. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, let's go on to, 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 to where was I? Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, we are going to Shobit Joshi. So I had a job with company A, I-94 expired in December last year, so 2017. Company A applied for extension before expiration of I-94. Then you got an RFE. Then you got laid off from A. And they said they won't reply to the RFE. You went back to India. In the meantime, you got an offer from company B. They filed H-1B under counselor processing. They also got an RFE. Now I'm applying for H-4 visa as my spouse has a valid H-1B. Is there any risk in applying for H-4 stamping? No, no, not at all. RFEs are a problem for the individual to apply for H-4 only if the RFEs question somehow any kind of fraud on your part. RFEs that relate to, okay, what is the job offer? Is there employee-employee relationship? Is the job a specialty occupation? All of them have nothing to do with H-4. You should be able to come on H-4 without any problem and there is no a questionable intention here. So that's fine. And I don't think you need your employers to revoke any application. They can continue uh, responding to the RFE. I don't see any problem with it. Okay. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question, star 5. Okay, I see. Oh, we have two more. Oh, I didn't notice. Sorry, guys. There are two questions, one from Connecticut and another one from California. So I'm going to go to... Let's see, uh, where am I going first? Connecticut. Let's go to Connecticut first. Sorry, I didn't notice your hand up. Go ahead. What is your question? Connecticut? Uh, hi, uh, Rajiji. So my question pertains to the last one, obviously. Uh, so the counselor processing that you're referring to is for 485. If my H1... Uh, okay, denied for some one, reason. one second, one second. See, the last step of the green card process 
can be done through one of the two methods. The last step of the green card process can be done through one of two mm -hmm. methods. If you are within the USA, you can file 485 adjustment of status. If you want, if you are in mm -hmm. USA, you want to go outside or your family is outside or you want to just apply from India or any other country, you can convert your case to consular processing. So last step can be filed adjustment of status 485 or consular processing, either one. Okay, and that's not to uh, appeal the hedge fund denial. That is only for the 485 filing, assuming right, the priority date. Right, right. That's the equivalent okay. of okay. the 485. Okay, all right. All Thank right. you. Good luck. Okay, now let's see. Uh, I don't think I have any other hands up. California has put their hand down. Okay, let's go on to, we just finished Mr. Joshi. Upasna Suri is in AOS 3B3. I-485 was done October 18th of last year. They wanted more documents like current pay stubs and all. I sent them. Since then, I've been waiting. I didn't receive anything from them. Called National Service Center three times. Three info pass appointment. They say my case is under review. It's outside of normal time. I did a tier two call also. The same answer. Congressman, same answer. I don't know what to do. Keep waiting or can immigration attorneys help us? I have three dependents, my spouse and my two kids. Their EAD will expire in August. You should renew your EADs. There's no doubt about that. EADs should be renewed. As to the question of what you should do on delays, well, that's a very difficult question to answer. Remember, because of separation of powers, judiciary doesn't like to interfere with its co-equal branch, the executive, which is USCIS. So normally courts don't like to interfere with delay cases, but laws and let me rephrase that, not the laws, but the judges' opinions are different in different circuits. So federal courts are divided by circuits. You have to see what the law in your circuit is. Have the people in your circuit been successful in delay cases? I'll give you an example. Delay cases in Washington, D.C., there was a delay case where government delay was 10 years and the court said that was reasonable. There was a case about a Bureau of Indian Affairs. Some tribe wanted a certification and that was to open a casino and all. So some of these cases, even 10 years delay has been held to be reasonable. It depends upon which circuit you are. Virginia is different. Maryland is different. DC is different. New York is different. California is different. So you've got to look into the uh, law of your own area. I discourage litigation for a couple of reasons. Unless we are absolutely desperate, I stay away from litigation in these kind of cases because a lot depends upon government discretion. H-1B cases, I'm very aggressive. I'll take them to court. Um, we haven't done, we haven't, we haven't had to for many, many years now, but I, I still hold the same opinion as I used to. H-1B cases, file a lawsuit. But I-485 is subject to a lot of discretion. So next thing is, even if you win the case, that doesn't get you approval. It gets you adjudication. They'll send you a 30-page RFE. Uh, so I would wait. That would be my advice. If things get really, really way out of line, I don't think it's that late right now. A couple of years, I would say, waiting. I would then go ahead and have you um, file for some kind of a lawsuit or some kind of a relief. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question on this. Star 5. Okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Hello, sir. How can I find out the law in New York? In your circuit? Okay. What you do yeah. is you can go to uh, just type in, in Google or Bing or whatever search engine you use. Just type uh, uh, immigration cases, federal court, New York. 
courts are at two levels and i think new york has two districts northern district of new york and southern district of new york uh, i could be wrong about this but i think that's how they are divided courts are at two levels in in federal um, well actually there are three levels but for your purposes one would be the district court which is the entry level court which is the trial court and then there is the appeal court which is called circuit court so look at the rulings on both the circuit courts and um new york district court and see if you can find this information the cases are all available publicly and better still if you have your lawyers um like for us to do online research on databases like westlaw and lexus it will take me about maybe 20 minutes to pull this information of course it takes a lot longer to read the cases but just to pull the cases regarding delay adjustment of status so typically um, if i were doing an online research it's like a um, it's a like a sql query so i would say look for cases where um, terms in courts adjustment of status and delay have been mentioned and i would look for it and typically that will pull out all the cases that deal with that issue so um you can see what the circuit uh, says by the way you might be able to file a lawsuit a lawsuit can be filed either where you live or where your company lives <laughs> or where the federal government lives so the law can be uh, the, the lawsuit can be filed in dc it can be filed in your home location or your office location okay but you can go online and try to find these cases thank you sir and i went for info pass yesterday and they said that uh, uh, it's under security checks i don't know what security check means they said uh, uh, your case is under security check typically what that means is there may be somebody with your name or matching your name or your background so somebody may have to do a physical check which means a, a live person has to make a few phone calls or visits and that can take a long time other security checks are online checks to do a database check takes only about 5 minutes for them so it's really not that difficult but when it comes to physical checks that might take a lot longer okay so i should keep waiting and then apply for renewal of ad yeah, for myself yeah but look time. at the law see if your circuit has favorable um, decisions okay or your lawyers can help you do that i mean that would be even easier for them it would be easier ead is are taking longer i applied for ead on october yeah, 27 yeah but once you apply for so ead to... they can continue working for 180 days even after the ead expires okay so okay thank you very much now. yeah good luck thank you you're welcome okay so let's go on to the next one Sanjay Mishra is on E2 visa for Australian citizens only. No, no, E2 is not for Australian citizens only. E3 is for Australian citizens only. E2 is for any country with which US US government has a treaty of trade and commerce. There are many many countries that have E2 visa. So, if your wife wants to work, she does have to apply for employment authorization. And there's a whole lot of controversy about this also. I'm not going to get into that but let's just take the easy route which is you do have to apply for employment authorization uh, and she then she can apply for social security number etc can she work as a volunteer uh, sanjay ji if you have um, access to if you go to linkedin and look at my articles on linkedin i think it's on my blog also you can go to immigration.com and look in my blogs also i wrote an article on volunteering while you are on h4 or f1 or f2 or any of these visas where work is not allowed and the conclusion was if you work without getting paid in cash or kind and that is okay but remember the company who takes your work might be in violation of federal laws because companies are not allowed to take free work unless they are a non-profit company or unless they are giving you training for your purposes not for their purposes star 5 if you have a follow up question star 5 okay let's go to 
Jay, next one. Wife is on H4 currently. She intends to apply for jobs again. She has an approved H1 from a start staffing company in 2014. We decided to switch her back to H4. Can the H1 be enabled again? Oh yes, absolutely. See, her H4 was H1 was approved, and I'm assuming it was approved with a change of status. So if the H1 was approved either with the change of status or she got a visa stamping, uh, it was approved within the last six years, which is 2014. So I don't see any problem. She's not subject to the quota. Star five, if you have a follow-up question on this, star five. Okay. We have a question from Illinois. Okay. Yes, Illinois, go ahead, please. Uh, okay, so uh, I have kind of the same situation and uh, does that no quota rule uh, apply only for the six year period for which the uh, H1 was valid? Let's let ask me that question another way. I'm not sure I understand that question. Okay, so uh, an H1 can be uh, used for six years to work, right? So if there was a break in between uh, and you know, uh, status was changed to an H4, just like that question. Mm -hmm. uh, while switching back to an H1, does it have to be within six years of when the original H1 was stamped uh, to be able to uh, like oh, no. not go through the oh, quota? Oh, oh, no, no, not at all. So let's, let's take your example further. Let's give it some flesh. So let's say like this uh, okay. um, Jay's wife, his, uh, her H4 was approved in 2014. Okay. So then let's say she converted to um, H4. Let's say that in, and she's used, let's say, let's change the hypothetical. Let's say she's worked three years and in 2014, she mm -hmm. quit her job. So she had already put in three years. Um, now in 2018, which is more than three years after her original H1 approval. So in the, in the seventh year of her H1 approval, if she wants to go back on H1, she's not subject to the quota. Why? Because her H1 was approved within the last six years, which is 2014. So even though she's in her seventh year counting from H1 first year as 2011, in 2018, she can still apply for H1 extension without being subject to the quota. Uh, okay. Okay. Perfect. All right. So I'm, I'm just going to repeat that one more time because there are too many facts. 2011, yeah. she got her approval of H1. She worked till 2014. In 2014, she converted to H4. Now in 2018, she wants to go back to H1. No problem. Because her H1 was approved in 2014 within last six years of 2018. You mean it stayed approved in 2014? No, she went back to H4. Her three years are go over. It didn't stay approved. Her three years were over. Okay. Huh? 2011 to 2014 she worked 2014 she quit she went back to h4 so it isn't approved anymore but it was approved within the last okay. six years of 2018 i see okay <laughs> i know it's a little but complicated. it was approved in 2011 so so her uh, h1 was, was approved in 2011 but it was it was approved till 2014 so this is where this is right. an interesting. Oh, that's what I meant by state approved till 2014, which was six years. Right. Uh, right within the right. six-year period. Okay. Right, right. But here is the interesting thing: counting 2014 as the trip-off date is policy, not law. The law merely says that your H1 was approved within the last six years. Law doesn't say that on the okay. date it terminated is counted as the within the six-year period date. That's policy. So if Trump administration changes this policy overnight, we would have a problem. Okay. And, and then the, the, the last day before which you can go back without going through the quota would be in 2017? Correct. Exactly. Of course, there will okay. be a lawsuit against a change in policy like that. And they would, 99% possibility is they will lose. Because government cannot change long-standing policy either without a good explanation or without going through regulation process. Okay, it'd be similar to what they're doing with H4EAD now, H4 and EAD it will go through a H4 long EAD, process. They passed regulations. It wasn't policy. Okay. It was regulations. If they want to change regulations, they can, but they have to give us a reason why. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. And they have to go okay. through rule making process again. Okay. Okay. I've already taken up too much of your no, time. No, Thank no you. Problem. Good luck. Okay. So Arminder says, can we apply for a waiver 212A6C1? Her father overstayed, returned back after seven years in 2006. During that time, he also filed immigration petition. But while coming back at port of entry, his application was withdrawn. He got rejected with the above tick mark. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, Arminderji, I'm not sure whether this is based upon any fraud or misrepresentation. If there is a fraud or misrepresentation, that's a permanent bar from entering USA. But you can get a waiver for temporary entries like B1, H1, L1, L2, etc. based upon something called a 212D3, D as in doctor, 212D3 waiver. So 212D3 waiver can be applied. I'm struggling with two or three cases like this right now where government has made observations, consulates have made observations of fraud and misrepresentation and I, th I don't think there is any fraud and misrepresentation. So those cases can be fought sometimes on this basis that you are calling something fraud, it is not fraud. You are just coming to that conclusion without giving me a chance to explain. So we've had cases like that, we have won some cases like that, but these are hard cases to win, it takes a long time, year, two years, just to get this thing straightened out. But if you just want a waiver, 212D3 is the one that you're looking at. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question. Star 5. Okay. So, this one is from California, I guess. Yes, California. Go ahead, please. Hi, Raju. Uh, my name is Radha Krishna. Uh, my priority date is current now. Okay, I have approved PAM and uh, 140 with the okay, previous employer. Hang on, not one, second, one second. I'm not doing any new questions right now. Uh, only ask me follow-up questions. If at the end of the hour we still have time remaining, I will try to answer everybody's questions, okay? I'm only dealing with posted questions okay. and their follow-ups right now. Okay, sure. Okay, Thank you. Stand by. Let's go on to, 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 to Shweta. Husband has his perm application filed recently. Should I file through my employer also? Yes, absolutely. Always file green card for husband and wife, em, wife's employment if you have two different jobs, even if with the same company. Always file two different applications. And there are many, many reasons for that. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question. No new question, please. Any follow-up on this? Okay, not a new question, all right. This is New Jersey. So, yes, New Jersey, go ahead, please. Yeah, Rajivji, I just wanted to check, like, one person can uh, file multiple green cards as well, right? That is correct. Not only can they file multiple green cards through employment-based, but they could have multiple green cards through employment-based, through family-based, through investment-based, you can file as many green cards as you like, as long as they are all filed in good faith, honest green cards. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good question. Okay. So then we come to SEPO range. Compelling reason EAD was approved. I am working. Son will be graduating in 2021. Then he will turn 21. Can he apply for F1 visa from USA? No, because once you go into EAD status, then you are not in status, you are in authorized period of stay, like 485 pending. So the whole family cannot change status within USA. Uh, you, he'll have to either keep getting his EAD extensions or go outside USA for visa stamping. When my priority date becomes current after many years, can any employer help me with the new H-1B and get my green card without subjecting to H-1B cap as my I-140 is approved? Yeah, I as the way I see the law right now, if your I-140 is approved, you should be able to get back, get back onto H-1 
without definitely within the six years of the last approval but it may be even past that the law is a little unclear on that so it's definitely worth a shot i think you will not be subject to the h1b cap even if it's more than six years since your last h1b approval okay yeah the, it, i don't blame your attorneys because there is this is def, definitely not a clear-cut area of the law uh, i haven't really looked at the regulations and the statutes and traced the entire history of the regulations but i i'm a i'm a practicing lawyer my job is to find solutions not to write articles about the theories so i would always file an h1 like that and i think it would go through star five if you have a follow-up question okay next question is um, a very good one should i be carrying my original green card at all times i have a blog entry on this go to immigration.com and go to my blog entries and i have written a fairly detailed article on what you should carry if you are a student what you should carry with you at all times if you are an h1 holder what you should carry at all times so go over that if this information is not clear because i don't remember what answers i wrote at that time i would have to go look at my own blog entry review it and if you st if you're not clear just go ahead and post again and i will find out the answer for you okay personally i think <clears throat> having even um um and i don't want to i don't want to preempt that let's just go ahead and have you look at the blog entry okay star 5 excuse me <clears throat> star 5 if you have a follow up question star 5 okay next one is from ashok applied for 485 in april 2016 with my spouse and son is dependents employment based i got my green card family is still pending made lot of info pass appointments something is pending in texas then there is another interview notice i went for interview she doesn't know why the application came there so this case is kind of shuttling around i think what you can do is ashok ji try to contact your congressman when there are multiple offices involved either a congressman's office or even the uscis ombudsman ombudsman is lokpal what they call in india lokpal so ombudsman can help but a congressman can help as well can an attorney do something we just have to chase it down like you would maybe we have fractionally more knowledge of what's going on when an application goes into a black hole like that it just needs a lot of chasing in my opinion a congressman who is willing to go further with the inquiries is your best bet okay so if that doesn't work then go ahead and get yourself a lawyer star 5 if you have a follow up question star 5 okay let's go on to suresh ji suresh ranga's son turns 21 next year if my son gets his green card after turn tw turning 21 does he need to go out of usa uh, well that depends upon whether or not your son is protected by cspa child status protection act so if your son his 485 is filed before he turns 21 no problem he will get his green card within usa okay star 5 if you have a follow up question on this okay so this is california california go ahead please uh yes uh, this is the, uh, regarding your previous question so uh, this is regarding my son turning 21 next year yes and um yes uh, um the thing is like uh, if if uh, we uh, he, he if uh, he uh, gets his green card after turning 21 now right now i'm homeschooling him because and and uh, converting his uh, visa to a, a student visa is not really possible at least as of now so does uh, do we need to convert uh, I mean, in order for him to stay in the U.S. after filing uh, 485, okay, do hang we on. need to convert? I understand your question. What happens is, let us say you file his 485 within his 21 year of chronological age, 
or 21 year of age as calculated under CSPA. So let's say, let's take the easy route out. You filed his 485 before he turns 21. Once you file his 485, he needs nothing else to stay in the USA. He can stay in USA legally under authorized period of stay because his 485 is pending. Clear? Yes, yes. On top okay. of that, if you file for his employment authorization, he can also work or go to school. Clear? Yes, on, okay. On top of that, if you apply for his advance parole and he gets it, he can also travel outside USA and come back in. So, 485 gives him the right to stay in USA, no questions asked. EAD gives him the right additionally to also work. Advance parole gives him the right additionally to also travel. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. So, when do I file for EAD or uh, advance we parole? We normally file it all. Don't with, have to. We file it all with the 485 normally. Oh, okay, okay. The whole package goes together. Okay, okay. All right. Bye. Good luck, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Kanaji. Bye. So the next question is from Ram about EB1C filing. So you see, it's not required for EB1C international manager that you must be uh, performing appraisals. It is not necessary that you must be doing appraisals. Should the above mentioned reporting structure satisfy the requirements? So basically, you get involved in a project from initial stage until completion. You manage various tasks like workshop, deliverables, coordination and provisioning, estimation, etc. You are given a set of resources, managers and technical resources. It looks like an EB1C to me. So EB1C comes in many different flavors, but the essence of EB1C is always this. You should not be involved in the production of the service. So if you are delivering software, you shouldn't be sitting down writing software majority of the time or doing system design majority of the time or QA majority of the time. What you should be doing is managing the provisioning of the service. So if you are managing the people who are producing the service, even though it is on a project-based basis, I think it would qualify for EB1C. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question on this. Star 5, okay. There is a follow-up question. And this one is also from New Jersey. New Jersey, go ahead, please. Rajiv uh, yeah, thanks for your response on that. Uh, uh, yeah, so basically the third point, uh, 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 should I have uh, these project members that I have been assigned, uh, they should be located in the U.S. Well, or if you, can they... If you had um, asked me this question about a year and a half ago, I would have said they have to be in USA. About a year and a half ago, um, USCIS has changed their position and they now take into account even the resources that you are supervising offshore. Oh, okay. Okay. So I can purely have resources uh, from offshore reporting it to me yeah, uh, based on that. I had a case recently on EB1C, very interesting case, in which he was the only one in USA, but his job was to streamline provisioning of the service which his team was creating, he was a lawyer actually, creating in India and basically he was just coordinating the services here in, in USA. He was the only employee in USA. The entire team of 50, 60 people he was supervising, other lawyers and engineers, they were all in India. So we were able to win that case. These cases got a little tricky, but I think it's definitely worth a shot. Okay. okay, and uh, the numbers doesn't matter, right? Like you have 5 or 50, it doesn't no, matter. No, 50 is so much better, 5 is so much worse. The more, the merrier. Okay, 
Okay, got it. And uh, uh, one other question, uh, Rajiv ji. Like, uh, I've been hearing about, see, if my company applies for the EB1C right now, I've been hearing they've been uh, there is a cutoff date that is introduced, and if I had applied uh, before March 31st, I would have been in a better position no, rather than now uh, with what. No, that's not true. What has happened is EB1 simply suffered a setback in terms of developing a um, a backup like EB2 and EB3, but these backups tend to clear fairly quickly. Oh, okay, okay. So if I apply it now, so I can anticipate this backlogs getting cleared and I, I being so. uh, might be I, I think so. current in EB. Also, what they are doing okay, is okay. the rate of denials in EB one A's, EB one B's has shot up tremendously. So I think over the oh. next few months, even if there is still a continuing backup, which I don't know, I, this I haven't seen the next month's visa bulletin. It just came out. Uh, even if the EB ones are still in a backup, they'll clear up fairly quickly. Okay, probably what might be the anticipation date, I saw that in 2017 it got cleared in October is what I had seen in some It form. might be earlier than that. So, it might be. What happens is there are, this is a very very complicated, uh, unnecessarily complicated system based more about upon projections and statistics rather than facts. And the way they allocate visa numbers is governed by a Diff, uh, um, a set of rules like you can only assign this many percentage of the anticipated quota in each quarter. Then in the last quarter, you can't exceed certain things. So sometimes in the second last quarter, they do a lot more opening. So it's it's there are too many rules and and um, um, I should say moving targets for me to give you a more definitive answer other than saying, hey, what do you have to lose? Apply as quickly as possible anyway. Oh, okay. That that was uh, all the rush report uh, applying before March 31st? Ah, that's all nonsense. I, I don't know who, who gave that advice. Uh, I, that doesn't make any sense. The only thing I can think of all is, right. uh, because here's what mm -hmm. happens. Visa Bulletin gives you the dates for filing for the next month. So if, if you look at mm -hmm. April Visa Bulletin, it tells you the dates that will be current in May. Okay. okay. So okay. what you do is, you don't file in April. If your date is current, you make sure you get it filed in May. Okay. So if the priority dates last, okay. if the priority dates were current uh -huh. in Go March, ahead. okay. But in April, we know mm. that they are going to recess. So everybody was trying to file their EB1 cases in March. That doesn't okay. mean they're going to get their green card any quicker. It simply means they'll get their 485 and EAD. That's all. Okay, they are able to push the 485 at the same time that's as 140. All. That's all. So right now, it's, it's, now I, I can just do 140, not 485, right? Uh, yeah, right now you can do just I I I 140 and continue on on your L1. What is the big deal? Yeah, H1. Okay. Either one, okay. H1 or L1. All right. Uh, all right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for your You're welcome. Good luck. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Uh, so. Amin has his MS in Electrical and Computer Engineering in USA. Approved I-140 from Employer A, it has been 180 days. Priority date would become current in 2025, oh Lord. Perm was applied as a software developer applications. Now, uh, Employer A mentioned three jobs spanning last year, two of them with my current employer. One as team lead, second as program analyst, Third, as a network engineer, experience is all related to software engineering. I want to move to employer B, who's offering network engineering job. Duties are totally different. If they file for a green card, it would also need to mention jobs held by me for the last three years. Should I wait for three years? Why? Why should you? What stops you from making lateral moves? Look, I'll give you an example. Let's say I'm practicing right now immigration law. But I was a litigator, I was also a business lawyer, I was also a corporate lawyer, constitutional law. I've done all sorts of things. If I decide to change my field, who can stop me from doing that? So if you have a degree in computer science and computer engineering, not only are you qualified to be a developer, you could do 10,000 other things also. So if you want to go back into networking, uh, why should you worry about what your job for the last three years was? I don't see any problem with that. And you only have to provide experience letters from old employers for the experience that you want to use. So let's say if you have 11 years of experience 
six of it is in software development and three of it is in in network um, as a network architect let's say and you want to use only experience as a network architect you only have to produce three years letters you don't have to produce 11 years i think you got the answers i think all of them are covered by this discussion if you have any follow up questions press star 5 okay let's see uh, this is also from new jersey okay uh, new jersey go ahead please yeah um so if i go to uh, employer b mm -hmm. and they are not filing for my green card right now mm -hmm. and then i can actually mm -hmm. to employer c so can i do that or of course. I employer of course. B? absolutely no problem okay. you can start as a network engineer with employer c d e f g no problem okay oh, i i thought um, once my employer a revoked i140 i have to no 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 once your i140 has gone past january 17th of 2017 and 180 days are over even if they revoke the date is your the right yours the right to extend your h1 with any employer um, is yours so nobody can take that away okay okay, okay. Right. thank you sir you're welcome okay let's go on to uh became a naturalized citizen this is lala la 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 <laughs> recently became a naturalized citizen son is nine currently overseas well i'm not sure how you file for naturalization in those circumstances i would have to look at the law there are too many rules that intersect on this i would say read the instructions on both n400 and n600 you see if i don't know if you're a father or a mother you are the mother yeah so you are the mother there's no such thing as a child born out of wedlock or in a wedlock for you this is a direct beneficiary for you so you should be okay either way uh, it doesn't change anything so look at the n 400 and the n 600 one of them will apply to you i don't know the answers off the top of my head star five if you have a follow-up question star five okay and this question is from Palak. I have done my master's at Stratford in Falls Church, Virginia. Oh, this is our neighborhood. This university is for profit, correct. So you can't do under master's quota. Yeah. You can't do H1B under master's quota. You can file another H1B as bachelor's quota. You can also go back on F1 if you are if your service is still active. So, uh, Palak, you won't be able to get your uh, master's quota H1 on a for-profit university. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question. Star 5. And the last question that has been posted, and we'll do new questions after that. I, have, I still have a few minutes. Applied for 485 in August 2007, EB3 received RFE for updated G325, I693, etc. Responded, got, went for an in interview, everything was fine, received uh, information that the case is transferred to TSC to balance the workload. Yeah, supplement J is needed again. What happened to all the updated documents? I am not sure what why they are asking you. The only thing I can think of is they might have misplaced or lost some documents in the transition. So it may be a good idea to take an info pass and go downtown and see what the computer says about your case. But in my view, it is always the easiest thing to do to comply with whatever they ask for. It will help speed up your case. But make sure you put in the cover letter that this information has already been uh, provided. Okay. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question. Star 5. All right. Let's do new questions. Anyone has any question, press star 5, please. Anyone has any question, press star 5. So, so far I have 2, 3. Okay. So, let's go to California first. 
Yes, California, go ahead, please. Hi, Rajiv. Yes, sir. Yeah, my priority date is the current now. Okay. I have approved permanent 140 with my previous employer. It is not revoked, still existing. Okay. Now I am working with a different employer. Okay. My current employer is not started my perm or GC process. Okay. So, so uh, if I, my current employer also similar job position. So can I file my 485B to form J? You cannot. Because supplement J only applies to those people whose 485 was filed and pending 180 days. Okay, so okay. in that case, like I have to file my new perm and 140 along correct. with 485. That is okay. correct. But if the old employer is still willing to hold the job open for you, there are some complications, but you can talk to your lawyers. Maybe you can file a 485 based upon their job. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. You're Let's go on to the next question. This will be the last two questions we'll deal with today. Uh, this one is uh, okay from Michigan. Michigan. Go ahead, Michigan. Michigan. Hello, Rajiji. Hello, sir. Um, my question is. I'm on. A, I have a I-140 approved on the EB2 category. Okay. And uh, after like doing some research and also what it was one of the questions we discussed in the call, okay. it looks like I qualify for uh, um, EB1C. So how do I start quoting my EB2 to EB1 and what are the complications? Well, EB1C is applicable for international managers who have worked one year out of the last three. This is a little bit more complicated than that, but let's just go with the simple uh, statement of the law one year out of the last three for a branch etc of a company they are currently working for outside the us so let's say you are from india and you worked for ibm india for one year then to came then then you came to usa on h1b or l1b and started working for another company or work for ibm usa ibm usa can file your green card okay, okay. Um, so I can file another I-140 in parallel to this. Absolutely. What I already have approved. Absolutely. And the dates are automatically transferred. You don't have to do anything. All right. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. And the last question. Well, I guess somebody else raised their hand. I had. I'll, I'll try to get to you, New Jersey. But uh, I'll do the Pennsylvania question. Depends upon how much time we had. Okay, uh, Cal Pennsylvania, go ahead, please. Pennsylvania. Uh, hi, Rajiv. Uh, this is a follow-up question. Um, uh, in one of the uh, uh, conference call, you were telling like when there is success and interest, mm -hmm. uh, we may need to do 140 amendment. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but today, uh, you, you, you said yeah. like uh, there might yeah. not if be you, if you listen, changes. Listen in the to what I said. What I said was this. I said when you have a success and interest situation, uh, normally, nothing nothing gets moved around too much. Your H-1B don't get affected. Your green cards don't get affected except to a certain extent. And that certain extent is refiling I-140. Oh, okay. So that, that means like uh, in any successor and in interest situations, uh, uh, refiling in 140 is uh, mandatory. It is required. Okay, Rajiv. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you very okay. much. Hang on. I want to clarify one thing, though. If your I-140 and 485 are both filed and pending 180 days, I-140 is approved, 485 is pending 180 days, you can use portability instead of I-140 amendment. Then you don't have to do I-140 amendment. Oh, okay. Now, my, one, my 485 is not, uh, you know, filed. Yeah, I-140 has to be amended. Okay. Oh, you mean like 140? 140. 140 has to be refiled. That's also what I meant. Uh, Amendment is like refiling, basically. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Rajiv. You're welcome. Good luck. Okay, last question, guys. I really don't have time after that. I've got to go. So let's do one last question. This one is from Illinois. Okay, Illinois, go ahead, please. 
Uh, hi Rajiv, uh, I have an H4 EAD uh, and it's expiring on the 27th, 26th of August and uh, uh, my wife has to uh, apply for an H1 uh, extension. Does it make sense for me to uh, request her employer to do a, a premium processing on her extension and do my EAD extension concurrently through the employer so that it gets done faster? Is, Why is there not? like a, Why not? Is that, that a thing? Why not? It is not necessary that you will actually get a premium for yourself. But it doesn't hurt to ask. Go for it. No, like the, the time that it takes to get the uh, EAD uh, extended, does that reduce if it is done concurrently with the... Not necessarily. That's what I'm saying. Because government is not bound to that time okay. frame. But they often do it. So that's why I said it's worth it. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. All right, folks. Good talking with all of you. I'll see you again in two weeks. Thank you for being here. I always enjoy speaking with you. Bye-bye. Every other Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we host um, free community conference calls. Everybody is welcome to join. Some people post questions ahead of time. You can take membership in our forums. Uh, all of the details are there on our website, immigration.com. You can take membership uh, ahead of time and um, you know it's instantaneous it happens right away and post your questions beforehand or you can just log in uh, the phone number and all are provided 202-800-8394 12 30 eastern standard time every other thursday we have uh, free apps for both apple ios platform for your iphones and ipads as well as for android just look for immigration.com immigration.com the period dot and uh, the application should show up